You are listening to a free version of Majority Report with Sam Steeter. To support the show and get another 15 minutes of daily program, go to majority.fm, please. The Majority Report with With Sam Sam Steeter. It is Monday. July 17th, 2017. My name is Sam Cedar. This is the four-time award-winning Majority Report. We are broadcasting live steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America, downtown Brooklyn, USA. On the program today, Craig Unger. On his piece in the New Republic, Trump's Russian laundromat. Also on the program today, John McCain ill and Trump care on life support. As the CBO delays its scoring based on the delayed procedural vote. Also on the program, Trump supporters shrink and harden. He's got the lowest approval rating in 70 years at 36%. Is that right? Oh, maybe at this time. I think it's at this time. Meanwhile, Trump chocks up a V. You're going to get so sick of winning, folks. He's killed more civilians in his first 175 days than Obama did in his eight years. And the Trump administration waiting on a Hawaiian judge who has effectively limited his Muslim travel ban And lastly, Trump gets credit for not stopping a high school robotic team from Afghanistan from attending a robotics competition. All that and more on today's Majority Report, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, there's a little bit of uh, more of the same quality that we have ongoing at this point. Right. It's uh, two stories. The parallel tracks and one being the sort of ongoing Russian investigations and how this is hindering, I guess, uh, Donald Trump's uh, agenda. And then the other is his and the Republican agenda, which is stalled now because John McCain apparently has had surgery for a blood clot behind his eye. And had to have his cranium removed or something to that effect. I mean, it sounds like... Stop milking it, John. It sounds like he's going to be there for a while. He was supposedly a no vote on the procedural question of raising this bill. But, I, I mean, John McCain, who knows? So that vote has been delayed. The CBO has delayed its scoring. We will have more on this. Still assume the Republicans are going to miss a couple of weeks of their recess. Don't know. But certainly there is an attempt by uh, the right wingers to continue to fight this fight even though they could very well lose it. Here is Britt Hume on Fox News Sunday. He's sitting uh, next to uh, Zeke Emanuel, who is um, a health policy guy, Rahm Emanuel's brother, sadly. And uh, But what's interesting here is Britt Hume seems to have stumbled on something without realizing it, which is that we should not have a... An insurance-based system, a private insurance-based system for delivering access to health care. I don't know if that's what his point was, but it sure sounds like that. 
the triumph of Obamacare is this coverage for pre-existing conditions, which basically defeats the whole idea of insurance, which is, for example, if in the automobile insurance market, if you could wait till you had a wreck and then buy insurance and have, have the repairs covered, that's comparable to what we're doing but here. But, Britt, if I have I mean, pause it, hold, hold on. on. Now, I want you to go back. Actually, that's not comparable. That's why you have a mandate. So people can't do that. What it, what it really is more like is if you bought a used car that has 85,000 miles on it and nobody's changed the timing belt yet. You know you're going to have to have a timing belt soon. And the insurance covers were to cover timing belts. I guess that metaphor is a little belabored. But just go back a little bit. Nevertheless, forget about his metaphor. His overall point, I think, is probably correct market. If you could wait till you had a wreck and then buy insurance and have, have the repairs covered, that's comparable to what we're doing but here. Brit, if I have I mean, cancer... Listen, hold on, let me finish. Can I please finish? We got the idea of insurance is that you, you purchase it to guard against risks and, and, and things that may occur in the future. It's not that you purchase the coverage after you're already sick. But if so, that, so once, once that idea but, is gone, Obamacare is got, essential, it remains. You got... If, if I have cancer through no fault of my own, I didn't hit a car, uh, I need to have insurance to cover me. This bill does nothing for those people. It only makes the price of their insurance ever higher. Yeah, I mean, that's right. But it sounds to me like uh, Britt Hume is on his way to understanding this is a really poor uh, system for delivering access to health care. I don't know. Maybe you tune in next Sunday and he's coming around to some type of like Medicare for all type of system or, you know, you just you basically just get a card in the mail and you go to your doctor with it. Hmm. We'll see. I don't think he's going to make it there, but who knows? I was talking briefly with a friend of mine from college and uh, she's she's Pakistani and she's, uh, you know, she's progressive liberal, but. She moved from she went to Harvard Business School. She works in the corporate sector and she moved to London. And she definitely was saying that, like, just the experience of the NHS has her politics were already on the left, but they're significantly because she's just like the idea that there are places where this isn't a universal system is just it's so actionably obscene now because she experiences it every day. It's right. like not having basic and society. And the NHS actually goes even, even further, further right, than right. a Medicare Much for further. all type. Yeah. But I, I spent some time in Australia. I mean, this was now uh, nearly 30 years ago, but I had uh, ear problems. I couldn't hear out of one ear. And I would go see the doctor. It was 20 bucks. Just because everybody's covered. I wasn't, I didn't have a green card. I didn't have, I was, it was just. 20 bucks. And we're talking about UK and Australia. The example I always use too is like going to Trinidad and they're like, oh yeah, yeah. if anything happens here, you're fine. <laughs> it's like Trinidad, man. You know, it's not, it's a second world country. It's a small Caribbean. Oh yeah, we're, you're covered. Folks, are you hiring? I don't know. I, don't, I mean, I don't know if you are, uh, but um, will you hire me? Honestly, I've been through this before, folks. Finding candidates for your job is a nightmare. But do you know where to post your job to find the best candidates? ZipRecruiter can post your job to 100-plus job sites with just one click. And then they have technology that matches the right person to your job. Better than anyone else. That's why ZipRecruiter is different. Unlike other job sites, ZipRecruiter doesn't depend on candidates finding you. It finds them. In fact, 80% of jobs posted on ZipRecruiter get a qualified candidate in just 24 hours. This is my favorite part. You don't juggle emails. You don't have calls to your office. I mean, I wouldn't. they wouldn't be able to call to my office. It would all be to my cell phone. Uh, you screen, rate, and manage candidates all in one place with ZipRecruiter's easy-to-use dashboard. If I was hiring right now, all you'd hear is ring, 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 ring during the, the uh, show. Find out today why ZipRecruiter's been used by businesses of all sizes to find the most qualified job candidate with immediate results. Right now, my listeners can post jobs on ZipRecruiter for free. That's right, for free. 
Just go to ZipRecruiter.com slash majority. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash majority. One more time. You can try it for free, folks. ZipRecruiter.com slash majority. And speaking, if, if you have a business, small business, even if you're, I wonder if Matthew Film Guy does this. Stamps.com. I mean, the guy oh, has right. got a eBay small empire. business out of his, he must send so much stuff. The amount of times he's got to go to the post office. Stamps.com lets you buy and print official U.S. postage for any letter, any package, any class of mail using your own computer and printer. Simply click, print, mail, and you are done. And it never closes. I don't know what time uh, Matthew Film Guy posts his eBay stuff, but I imagine it's like 3 in the morning. You can print postage for letters or packages at your convenience 24-7. Plus, they even send you a digital scale that automatically calculates exact postage. They'll help you decide the best class of mail based upon your needs. Stamps.com brings all the services of the U.S. Postal Service right to your fingertips. Right now, you, too, can enjoy Stamps.com service with a special offer that includes a four-week trial plus postage and a digital scale without long-term commitments. Just go to Stamps.com, click on the microphone at the top of the homepage, type in Majority Report, one word, Majority Report. At Stamps.com, enter Majority Report. Stamps.com. Never leave your little eBay enterprise in Queens again to get stamps. And lastly, uh, I am back in the studio this week, so I'm fully clothed. But (laughs) I'm not saying I I mean, yeah, I am. I'll be honest. Um, It's very abusive. But the (laughs) he wears nothing in here. (laughs) Well, no, that's not that's not my point. My point is that if I wasn't fully clothed, I'd at least be in me undies. Right. They're the softest, most comfortable underwear you will ever wear. Period. End of story. And look, summer is the perfect time to upgrade your underwear drawer. Really, any time is, but summer's good, too. Why? Because everybody's going outside. You're feeling good. You're looking good. Every pair of MeUndies is sustainably sourced and made from micro-modal fabric that's three times softer than cotton were you aware of that matt like i knew you knew it was softer than cotton i know you've been on it for two years three years whatever it is but did you know that was three times softer than cotton i'm not so quantitative so i wouldn't have been able to put it like that but it's finally what convinced him to stop i'm not surprised now that i hear it finally convinced (laughs) you to stop going commando this month's patterns were designed by the legendary 80s clothing brand cross colors with names that live up to their bold design and bright colors. Increase de peace. Ya dig. And the OG. Right now, you'll save 20% off your first pair and receive free shipping. Only at MeUndies.com slash majority. That's MeUndies.com slash majority. There's a reason MeUndies has sold over 5 million pairs to date. And that's, I would say, probably like 2.5 of those are at least just Matt going around talking about it. Modal, man. If you don't love your first pair of MeUndies, they're free. There's this huge, like, MeUndies is sitting there just going, like, why is there this, like, huge, we've got all these thumbtacks around North Dakota. Get 20% off your first pair plus free shipping at MeUndies.com slash majority right now. That's MeUndies.com slash majority. MeUndies.com slash majority. The boys got news from New York City. Apparently there's a new underwear there's, company. Oh, my God. <laughs> Sweetheart, would you say 2.5 times more more soft than cotton? I'm just, I mean, I assume all the Jews up there like to keep themselves comfortable when they're controlling the world's currency supply. <laughs> <laughs> all right, we got to take a break. When we come back, Craig Unger on Trump's, what's that? That's what I said. Frank. <laughs> Completely misheard. You. Frank Unger is the guy from like House of Cards. Craig Unger. Oh, that's Frank Underwood. Frank Unger is better. Craig Craig Unger on Trump's Russian laundromat. We'll be right back.
We are back. Sam Cedar on the Majority Report on the phone. It is a pleasure to welcome to the program contributing editor of Vanity Fair, author of House of Bush, House of Sod, which I think may be the last time we spoke, uh, actually, uh, and uh, uh, talking about his piece in the New Republic, Trump's Russian laundromat, Craig Unger. Craig, welcome to the program. Thanks for having me, Sam. Uh, so, all right, Craig, let's let's start with um, just the, the in your piece you outline the sort of the long term relationship that Donald Trump has had at the very least to uh, Russian money in terms of uh, a number of his properties. But let's start w- first with this guy Semyon Mogilevich. What can you tell us about him? Right. Um, Semyon Mogilevich is the most powerful mobster in Russia, and he has been so uh, for well over 30 years. He's worth about $8 billion. He's five foot six and around 300 pounds, and he's uh, enormously powerful. He does have a personal relationship with Vladimir Putin, and he's also, he, he has his fingers in many, many pies, but one thing he is extraordinarily uh, highly regarded for is money laundering. And that's absolutely essential to Russia today. Russia has become a mafia state. There's been approximately $1.3 trillion in flight capital since Putin has been in power. And that calls for a lot of money to be laundered. And and so, I mean, so, I mean, real estate represents something I mean, does it represent something unique when it comes to money laundering, or is it uh, just one of many different types of uh, methodologies? I, I think it's incredibly important, because if you need to launder that kind of money, the other way that's sometimes used are casinos. And of course, um, uh, Donald Trump owned casinos as, as well in Atlantic City. But anti-money laundering laws have a $10,000 limit, and and when a transaction bigger than that takes place in casinos, it has to be reported to authorities. So to launder that extraordinarily vast amount of money uh, would require sending hundreds of thousands of people to casinos. Uh, With real estate, uh, starting in the 80s, and, and this was where Trump was... Uh, very early, uh, Trump Tower, which was built in 1983, was only the second building in New York City that allowed buyers to use shell companies like limited liability corporations that allow the buyer to remain anonymous and to shield his identity. Wow, I had no idea that that... Why, now why, why is that the case? I mean, was that just... And, and now it seems to be sort of more common practice, right? But what... what what led to to that? Just that's what uh, people came with money, wanted to hide themselves or? Well, I, you know, I, I would love to do more research and find out the answer to that question. But it, but it opened an enormous gateway. And I talked to Jonathan Weiner, who was sort of the anti-money laundering czar during the, the Clinton era. And he said, well, that was the huge loophole that was never closed. And, you know, I I live in New York here down in in Tribeca, and you see these humongous 90-story buildings going up with uh, uh, apartments that sometimes go for 50, 60, $100 million for a single apartment, and they're sitting there empty. And, um, you know, and I'm sure there are Chinese and people from all over the world, but a huge portion of it uh, goes to the Russians, especially when it comes to Trump buildings. All right, so um, let's go and talk about this uh, guy, Edward Nektolov. Um and, and what is his relationship uh, to Trump? Well, he uh, lived in uh, Trump World Towers, uh, which is at uh, 845 UN Plaza. It's a building right next to the United Nations. Um I, I was going to say it's 90 stories, but Trump always exaggerates the the number of stories. Someone, I think it's actually 72 stories, but Nektolov lived on the 79th floor, uh, just as Trump lives on the 68th floor of a 58-story building. And Nektolov, I, you know, I, I was trying to, 
I, I spent most of the article focusing just on Trump Tower. That was the crown jewel of Trump's empire. It's where he still lives. But I, I decided to look into another building because uh, uh, Trump and the first person I looked at was Nektolov. And when I Googled his name, the first thing that came up was uh, that he was had been indicted for money laundering. The second thing came up that was that he was uh, cooperating with authorities. So the third thing that came up was he was assassinated the next day. And that's sort of typical. You find in, in that building, floor 76 to 83 are, I, I believe, more than a third of the uh, residents there are Russians. And what you see is an, a huge number of apartments being sold in Trump-branded properties to uh, Russians or residents of the former Soviet Union. So how is it that, I mean, you know, and I imagine there's there's Russian money in various different buildings around the country. And I mean, I, I should say the city anyways. But how is it that so much uh, of that money uh, in his buildings, particularly in Trump Tower, came from uh, Russian oligarchs? Well, well, one is these are these are not just ordinary Russians. And a lot of them are either mobsters or, or, or oligarchs. And I found... 13 in, in just uh, Trump Tower alone, and I, I, I think I added in Nekhlov and maybe one or two others from other buildings. But I, I'm reasonably sure this is the tip of the iceberg, and part of it is that so many units there are owned by shell companies, where it's impossible for me, at least, for, for ordinary reporters to penetrate those shell companies and find out who is the real owner of it. So in, in, in a lot of ways, I'm, I'm thinking and, and frankly hoping that that's something Robert Mueller goes after because you need subpoena power to find out the answer there. If you look at the Trump buildings in Sunny Isles, Florida, or in Panama City, Panama, where you wouldn't necessarily expect lots of Russians to hang out, many, many units there uh, are really owned by Russians. And, and this, I, I mean, when you, when you look at the whole um, pattern, what you see is Donald Trump would never become president without the help of the Russian mafia. Let uh, I me mean, explain that. Well, the, the money comes from two sources. One is, I, I mean, I go back to uh, 1984. I tried to ask the question was, that if Trump was compromised by Russia, when and how did that happen? And in 1984, a guy named David Bogdan came over from Russia and met with Trump. And he sat down and uh, di didn't buy just one condo or two. He bought five. And the state attorney general later ruled that that transaction was to launder money. He had ties to Mogilevich. So here you see that, that to me, that was the first tie where... It appeared that that Trump was laundering money for people tied to the Russian mafia. And you can see that pattern go on for more than 30 years. Uh, in some places like Sunny Isles, Florida, there are hundreds of units sold to Russians uh, that way. Um, same for Panama, uh, for, for Trump Tower, Trump World Tower, for, for Trump Towers itself. But in later years, you see a second phase happening uh, starting around 2002. And in that, and, and that time, uh, Trump had faced multiple bankruptcies. He was approximately $4 billion in debt, couldn't get a bank loan. And then the Russians came to his aid again and started financing his properties. And, and, and the, it's not your contention in the piece that Trump was, I mean, there's no evidence, let's say, of him knowing, right, that, that he was money laundering. There's no evidence uh, that it's just, it is, it's just an amazing coincidence. Or, or we should say, I mean, to be fair, this is a guy who clearly doesn't care where his money comes from, right? I mean, so how hard is it, how hard is it to sort of like, have the guy show up with a suitcase full of money or however they deliver their money to buy these apartments um, and ignore where the money's coming from. 
Well, you know, it's very hard to prove that Trump is knowledgeable, trying to get it, prove it about anyone, much less Trump, that they know certain facts, unless you maybe have uh, emails or certain documentation or subpoena power that, where you can really cross-examine them and play one witness off, off another. So, no, I, I don't have that smoking gun. At the same time, the number of coincidences uh, just defy imagination. I mean, what was, you know, my, my methodology in this was I got a database of all the people who lived in Trump Tower, and every time I saw a Russian name, I started to Google it. And what was extraordinary was the number of times um, major figures in organized crime like Mogilevich came up. Uh, uh, there, there, you know, you had a gambling ring based in Trump Tower that was busted in 2013, I believe. Um, and, and you just have one uh, a major fiasco after another like that. So it's hard to believe this is just a coincidence. Um, all right. So what what is the most striking uh, relationship as far as you can tell? Well, I, I think the long, long standing relationship is, is between people tied to Mogilevich and Trump. And, and, I, and I, I think what, what was the, the other extraordinary development started around 2002. And when that happened, uh, a company uh, called Bayrock started leasing space in Trump Tower itself. This is a real estate development company. And it, too, is tied to the mob. And you have Felix Sater, who's gotten uh, been written about a, a bit lately, as the managing director. And his father was tied to, uh, was a member of the Mogilevich gang. Uh, and so this was a very different phase in which it wasn't just a matter of Russians buying a $2 million condo here or a $5 million condo there. They put up about a billion dollars to finance Trump projects. And the new paradigm was Trump was bankrupt. He couldn't get a bank loan anywhere to save his life. And the Russians said, OK, well, we'll put up a billion dollars. You don't put up a dime uh, and we will give you 18 percent of the profits so long as we can license your name. And that was the new paradigm for Trump. That was the new model. And there are now over 30 Trump Towers all over the world, from Baku to Panama City, uh, Toronto, uh, and uh, Florida, New York, everywhere. So uh, let's talk a little bit about Felix Sater. I mean, he is, um, re I mean, I, you know, as far as I can tell, uh, just from news reports, he is both uh, an FBI or has been an FBI an informant and I think was also credited with being a CIA informant um, from what I can tell from just uh, written statements from various people, including um, uh, the former A.G. Lynch uh, back, I guess, when she was in the um, Eastern District of, of Manhattan U.S. Attorney's Office. I mean, so... Well, uh, tell us a little bit more about Felix Sater, because he, he, to me, strikes me as a very interesting figure. Well, he, he's fascinating. He's been convicted twice. Once he got into a, a bar fight and stabbed a guy in the face uh, with a mar broken margarita glass. Uh, the second time he, w he was convicted in a pump and dump uh, stock scam. And then, uh, as you say, he turned uh, government informer. And the, in, in many ways, he's sort of a Russian version of Whitey Bulger. I don't know if your listeners are yes. familiar with Whitey Bulger, but he started working with, with the FBI and they kind of allowed him to continue with his criminality. And in, in this case, with Bayrock, Seder was a Bayrock, and Bayrock uh, appears to, I mean, there's certainly charges in court that it was a, uh, largely a massive money laundering operation. What, I mean, one of the interesting thing, questions you have to ask is how knowledgeable was Donald Trump on this? Because if he was knowledgeable, if that could be proven in court, then presumably he would be uh, in legal jeopardy with regard to racketeering, bank fraud, money laundering, and so forth. So, wait, so I mean, if uh, and 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 Sater was at one time a special advisor to Donald Trump. 
He was. He had a business card that uh, said, uh, I think his title was senior advisor. And it, it, I actually, the, the phone number on it, uh, I'm told, was the f phone number for the general counsel of the Trump organization. And so, I mean, if if Felix Sater is a, an informant for the FBI, like what or was, what was he informing them about? I mean, I'm just curious, like, at, at what point... Is he, uh, you know, he has this relationship with Donald Trump, and at that time he's also an FBI informant. I mean, what, what are they looking, what are they getting information from this guy from? Well, there, there were, I mean, I, I think with regard to the FBI and CIA, there was uh, uh, a lot of stuff with regard to foreign policy. Sater's value increased dramatically after 9-11, and um, I believe he helped inform about arms dealing uh, and the sale of Stinger missiles in Afghanistan. But, but I, I think he raises some very, very interesting questions. And one of the central things, points here I don't want to be overlooked is that the Russian mafia, when people hear the word mafia, I think they think of the Sopranos and the Godfather and that sort of thing. The Russian mafia is very, very different. It's an adjunct to Russian intelligence. And I think what Vladimir Putin has done that's extraordinary, and, and a lot of Americans don't realize, is he's created a mafia state. And that means he's weaponized the Russian mafia to use it as a powerful geopolitical weapon. And so that in a way that when you see uh, the, how much Trump is indebted to the Russian mafia, and you realize he's president of the United States is beholden to the Russian mafia that he probably he would not be in the White House. They he he was washed up. He was four billion in debt when they came to his rescue. So that that is the scary thing to me that the president of the United States is completely indebted to the Russian mafia, and that's an adjunct of of Vladimir Putin and Russian intelligence. When you talk about Sater as being a uh, Whitey Bulger character, and, and just to tell people, Whitey Bulger was um, a, um, I guess, an organized crime figure in uh, Boston, uh, really, I mean, big during the 70s and into the 80s. His brother was actually the uh, speaker of the, uh, or the, the, I guess, the president of the Senate, the Massachusetts Senate. And uh, what was going on is the FBI was letting him uh uh, uh, kill people uh, in addition to other crimes. And it was really sort of like a, there was a big fight between the Stadies in Massachusetts and uh, the FBI. Well, so what was, who does he, in, in this, if this is the analogy, who does Sater have this uh, relationship with uh, in New York? Is it the New York FBI office, A, and B, uh, if this guy is a special advisor to Donald Trump, I mean, what 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 does the FBI know about Donald Trump? Well, I'm I, talking I, prior I would to it even further and ask what what do the Russians know about Trump uh, uh, as well? One, you know, if, if you go to the Steele, the Christopher Steele dossier, to me, the most puzzling thing allegation in that dossier, the one that really kind of blew my mind was. Uh, one that said Trump was passing intelligence to Vladimir Putin. And that didn't make any sense to me because uh, to be a spy, you're supposed to be fairly disciplined and uh, be able to compartmentalize stuff. And I, I think Trump is whatever he is, he kind of uh, uh, is a little, little too spontaneous for that. But I realized at a certain point that Bayrock was actually located in Trump Towers. They were selling hundreds and hundreds of condos. And what is tr truly important to Vladimir Putin is keeping tabs on the oligarchs. They are absolutely crucial to him maintaining power. And if, if Bayrock was selling condos to them, then uh, uh, they would have uh, access to all that information and be able to transfer it to Putin. Um, I mean, it, it, it's really like having a Russian spy nest in the, the home of the president of the United States. 
I guess, I mean, I, I don't mean to keep harping on this. And if if this isn't, you know, an area where you, you have info, then, you know, uh, um, uh, no problem. But I just, I'm curious as to um, what the uh, FBI, the people who were working with Seder, I mean, this guy was, was prominent enough that, um, like I say, uh, Lynch was writing letters on his behalf at his sentencing hearing. And in his, uh, and, and so um, I, I'm just curious as to uh, if this guy was an asset, was Donald Trump an asset? What, or, and maybe knowingly or unknowingly? I mean, like, what, what do you have any sense of what the of what the FBI I'm talking prior to even the campaign? Um, you know, if this guy is just views that viewed as, you know, um, I don't know, like the, the guy who owns the, um, uh, the, 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 the salami, the meat market where, uh, the Sopranos used to hang out. I mean, or, or is he, is, was he something different? Well, there, you know, there, there are questions there. I don't know the answer to, and they're the subject of very intensive litigation, uh, there have been internal battles within Bayrock, and two tr attorneys, Frederick Oberlander and Richard Lerner, have have sued to get Shader's files un, uh, unsealed. And so far, we just I just don't have all the answers to those questions. They're intriguing questions, and I wish I could get to the bottom of it, but I have not yet. Interesting. And and so, I mean, just give us a sense of like in terms of laundering money, how does it work with I mean, they buy the they buy the real estate. Why is that a more effective means of laundering than, let's say, I mean, I guess buying a car, you're just not going to be able to move as much money. But what what happens to that money once they buy it? Do they just turn around and sell the apartments or they wait or is it like putting it in a bank? I mean, what? Well, it, it, it's a hugely effective way of moving huge amounts of money. That is, the two most powerful ways of, of uh, laundering money tend to be casinos and real estate. But with casinos, you have a limit of ten thousand right. dollars above which the casino has to report to authorities that there has been a, a transaction of over ten thousand dollars. With real estate, there's almost no regulations whatsoever. And that is, if, if you and if you pay cash. Um, essentially, you're, you, you, you know, there are no hurdles to, to overcome. And you can spend $2 million, $5 million, $10 million on an apartment. And then through, through a shell company, if, if, if you have a shell company and I have a shell company, we could sell it, the same apartment, back and forth um, multiple times per year, laundering, I don't know, 2 or $5 million each time. Also, if you think about it, Trump ha has many thousands of units. He, there, are, uh, there are over 30 Trump Towers. There are roughly 300 units in each one. Uh, so you can sell, launder huge amounts of money. Wow. Um, Craig Unger, uh, the piece is Trump's Russian laundromat. We will put a link to it at majority.fm. Thanks so much for your time today. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right, folks. I mean, it just um, it's an interesting sort of fact that uh, to flesh out a little so bit. He sold some condos to Russians. So he sold condos to Russians. And I guess if you and Greg and everyone else there gets their wish, we'll have war with Russia. And that's great. That way, <laughs> Robbie Mook doesn't need to take accountability. Meanwhile, Democrats can't get their message straight, and they're killing single payer in California. But I guess you and Michael and Matt and everyone else, y'all just pat yourselves on the back for more Russia bashing. New Cold War on wannabe MSNBC. I, I don't think I'm uh, bashing Russia to say they're very uh, entrepreneurial <laughs> with the way that they uh, buy all these apartments. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm... I, I I am just fascinated by this uh, connection because it seems to me, I mean, this is, um, I think, to the extent that there's uh, intrigue around the Trump, uh, Trump Inc., I suspect much of it starts here. And, may, and maybe some of it even ends here. Although I'm pretty convinced there is a P-tape, too. <laughs> it does start to. I think. I, I think it actually was Malcolm Nance who made this point, and I, I do have some, uh, you know, hesitation to cite him. But he had a great point that a, that whole steel memo, which you know we don't know, obviously isn't substantiated. But 
the really, you know, that memo basically says that Trump is like a personally compromised asset of a foreign government, right? And his, <laughs> and, and Nance is like, the least upset, like, the part of that memo, other than it being embarrassing, that Trump should be designing most vigorously is that, like, not that he got peed on. Right. right. Like, they, there's slightly more important accusations in that t- uh, document than whatever his gross sexual habits might be. I mean, I can see just broadly speaking from a political standpoint, you you do that because and particularly, I mean, look, you also got to say he's a guy who got on a stage and argued that his he had no problems in terms of his penis size. Did not have any problems. (laughs) So it's not like that would be out of character for him to focus on that. I loved little Rubio, little Marco holding his hands up. That's that was Marco's greatest moment in public life. And then he just completely wimped out on it. Like well, he started that's down why that they call road. him Little Mark. Oh, God, he's such a punk. Uh, folks, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we'll be talking uh, more about um, uh, health care, including um, Mike Pence gave a speech uh, wherein he showed that um, he's perfectly capable of lying uh, in regards to the health care bill. Susan Collins is... Um, Really trying to sound reasonable on this, trying to figure out how can I, boy, these the, the, the so-called moderates just really would love to leave town. Um, and then uh, you're going to love Jay Sikolow. Sikolow? Sikolow, I think, yeah. I think in Colin's case, I'm, she, I don't know. I don't know what her... her dynamics are in Maine, so maybe there's something I don't know about, but she really should just become an independent I think she's with Democrats. Inc- she's she's basically a right I mean she and that's not complimentary of Democrats. She's I think she's terrible, but it would be a safer position probably for her to be in. Although yeah, because she doesn't I will tell you she this, can skip a primary. If um yes. I mean there if you could make that pitch to two Republicans, right? Um I suspect if there was a way to do that, I mean, it's not inconceivable. I mean, you know, people forget this, that, that type of intrigue goes on all the time. During uh, the Bush years, John McCain was about to flip uh, at one point. I mean, he wanted to be John Kerry's running mate. And he was about to flip at one point. Uh, it is really a function of, for a lot of these people, how can they put themselves... There's two things. One, how can they put themselves at the fulcrum of everything that's going on to satiate their ego? And the other is, how can I make my life easier as a politician? And, you know, like, I wouldn't be surprised if a guy like Dean Heller wasn't there. What you know, there wasn't a conversation in his office like just for, you know, some uh, some giggles. So what I've heard is that, and I think it was uh, the Favreau, like the Obama guys, I think were saying this, like on that Keeping It 1600 or whatever their podcast is called, but that uh, the only reason that Heller is not a solid no on this, because Sandoval opposes it, who's a Republican. And it's very difficult and for him. Deeply, is that Steve Wynn is basically personally like, basically like, if you vote against this, I'm going to destroy you. I'm going to primary. Yes. It's literally one casino plutocrat terrorizing this guy that's the only reason he's up in the air and i my understanding is steve Wynn is blind now and really? so yeah so that's what happens you lose one sense and you you build another <laughs> and it, that must be just you know <laughs> domination or but i mean for like a guy like Adelson's dean heller, not even I mean, look, doing it look I like, I mean like if you got a guy like dean heller he's got to look at this and say like okay if i flipped and became a democrat right skip the primary threat i have no primary threat yeah. i mean i from his perspective, like the obviously the deal w- he would cut a deal with the Democrats, right? And there would be a primary. I would imagine it wouldn't be hard to find somebody, but I, I think it's like the 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 establishment would be with him, of course. And um, it makes a lot more sense to try to turn those Republicans than Republican voters. In my opinion. Oh. Like, yeah, they're a lot more rational. Yeah. 
Um, I mean, I'm, I'm just, I'm just, I, I'm not advocating this. I'm just suggesting that it's very possible. You know, Dean Heller meets uh, Susan Collins at the uh, commissary, and very over over use. tapioca, they're they're talking about it. I don't know who else would be a candidate for something like that. To be honest with you. Maybe Jeff Flake, who is getting Maybe. briefed, but I doubt it. No, I doubt it, because Flake's also still playing to the far right, because he came out with, but he supported Cruz's thing specifically. Uh, I don't know. Not Cop Capito, no. Nope, nobody so else. Be those two. And Murkowski might just vote against it. And didn't she already, years ago deal with her own crazy primary yes. challenger so maybe she's a little bit inoculated like you guys already because didn't she right. lose and then win as an independent uh, wrote no as a write-in as a yeah yep. so i would imagine she's like yeah what are you gonna threaten me with all right folks i'm gonna take a quick break uh just a reminder it is your support that makes this program possible you can become a member by going to join the majority report.com join the majority report.com uh, we are constantly building and scheming, devising, um, when we're not assassinating. <laughs> and, oh, I'm going to uh, need some time to go to Haiti in September, just uh, FYI. And uh, <laughs> you mean to get back from Haiti, right? Didn't you? I don't know. Uh, all right. <laughs> So uh, your your support helps us uh, keep this program alive and to hide the double lives that we're leading here at the Majority Report. You can go to join the Majority Report and um, and sign up. Also, justcoffee.coop, fair trade coffee, tea, or chocolate. Use the coupon code MAJORITY, get 10% off. Also, you can gift uh, the Majority Report, and I don't even know the URL. Is it? Uh, I mean, I'll, the only one I know is is the... The Cuck Nation one. Majority Gift, I think it is, dot com. I should probably... Yeah, MajorityGift.com. So if you want a gift, you can gift one month. You can gift a year. Super, super easy to do. So MajorityGift.com. Going to take a quick break. 646-257-3920. 646-257-3920. We're going to open up a line... For uh, libertarians and for people who are upset that we talked about the history of money laundering that's taken place at Trump Towers because of the World War II that we'll be starting. Three. Maybe we'll go back to World War II. I could see some callers in that vein thinking that we're about to have World War II. There you go. All right. Quick break. We'll be right back. She said, no, no, no. 